scientific, and that's evidence. That's pretty much you cannot get us. That global warming hurts the economy. That's pretty well said. Okay, so you said that in 1997 there was consensus about global warming. Is that true? I think there's been kind of consensus about global warming for a lot earlier than that. Okay, so why was there between the initial draft from, from what you went to mission and between the final report, why were sentences questioning the human impact immediately? Why were questions? I have no idea. I mean, why were well, passages that were questioning the human impact on global warming deleted between the initial draft and I, the final report in 1999? I don't know. I'm not aware of any word. You're not aware. No. So if I tell you to do a word, do you think there's a reason for it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, do you know how many scientists were actually agreeing that global warming is on its way in 1997? I do know the preponderance of scientists out there believe that there are a few rogue scientists working for oil companies that... <laughs> so, what you, you would be saying is that 13% of Canadian scientists is an overwhelming majority believing that global warming is on its way. I, I think those 13% of the Canadian scientists uh, are part of a global voice that says global warming is a problem. So also the 20% of Great Britain scientists are all organized. They are also part of that big voice. Ah, okay. So you said... The other scientists in Britain work for British Petroleum. Uh, okay, you said that. Yeah, there's more of the scientists that believe that global warming for the life is a problem. I mean, if that's what the debate's going to get down to, whether global warming is, is harmful or not, I mean, we'll definitely narrow the debate to that. Okay, do you believe right now that we know that humans, the humans are responsible for global warming? The humans are responsible for global warming? Yes. I yes. would think we contribute to it, yeah. Okay, so you said that Kyoto was set up so we could find out if humans are responsible for global warming. No, Kyoto was, Kyoto was set up to decrease emissions, but there were a lot of added advantages, Scott, you told you on the off case. Technology exchange, training and education, information exchange. So in other words, if, if we're going to go back and forth on scientists agree, not agree, you know, we should have got into Kyoto so we could kind of really gather information so we could make better decisions in the future. I mean, that was really the added advantages that she's talking about off case. Just for not being addressed in this debate. Okay. If you're saying there's massive movement in the U.S. Yes. in response to being like outraged by adverse decisions, so if global warming initiatives are happening, why do you need to kill them anyway? No, what I'm saying is you argue the grassroots, and I agree with you, I, that, that grassroots did take place. But what you didn't tell the audience was that grassroots roots in the United States took place because Bush pulled out of Toyota. So the cities itself got in and said, you know what? We like Kyoto Protocol. Right. And so 825 cities got together and said, we like it. Let's stay with it. So you won't be seeing me, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a very small person. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what Mark just did was that he presented you five minutes of Buddha, Shuddha, Kuddha, and we believe that this is not a way to debate. Yeah, yeah. What we want to propose, and I want to sum up uh, this debate up, is on three points. I firstly want to speak to you again why this was a poor agreement when we speak of that certain time, why the US thought it was not justified for them to take such a bad treaty. We secondly want to show to you how it harms US interest and hence how US has the right to reject it since they have a duty to protect their citizens and their own interests. And last but not least, I'm going to discuss the idea of consequences, or the idea from the negative side, first of all, how it was detrimental to the international community. We seem to say this is absolutely untrue. And I also want to explain to you a bit about the uh, grassroots level. Before that, just two things I want to say against Mark and the whole uh, negative team. Firstly, they have been putting this idea forward that we, as the ones who have been protecting the US, are totally saying we do not care about the environment, and that the US has not cared about the environment during Kyoto, before, before Kyoto, and that now they have started to. We firstly have said that that is necessarily not true. We have said that the US has been caring about the environment, and this is uh, how we have been seeing, for example, the EPA doing stuff good in the US. I'm not going to get into that because it's just, you know, a whole point of view argument, but I think it's quite logical to say that the US does generally care. They just didn't care about the Kyoto. And I secondly want to really tackle this issue of European countries, because as I just studied environmental law, it's just so cute. Sweden and UK are probably not the best examples of the European Union traditional countries, because Sweden is just so rich and fluffy. Well, of course they were going to meet their deadline. The UK also has, you know, very good stuff and very good economy, because in fact they have been able also to burn all of their fat stuff away and now have been able to concentrate on the economies that do not pollute that much. And we also say, what do you think of other big European economies? 
We see right now that the big countries, France, Germany, we also see that the normal countries and the, or the, the traditional countries such as Greece, Portugal, they are all struggling with this sort of climate change. And we say, hence we can see this would hurt their economy. And we say this is going, would have hurt the US, US economy as well. So as I can see, I already have timing issues. Moving on to the point of four agreement. We firstly say that this world of 2009, well, we all believe that global warming is just a scientific fact, was not so 10 years ago. We believe, when I was in my country, and I want you to all to think of this on an individual level, we believe that we, when there was this uh, Kyoto Treaty, people did not believe necessarily that global warming was true. We, we also have evidence from Shabira pointing out that the UN Commission on Climate Change actually concluded that global warming is not necessarily man-made. And then there comes up this negative side and says, well, it was just true because, well, it's just true and because we had Hurricane Katrina. We say that's all very cute and we believe accidents happen and that's very sad. But we say during that time that was not true. And hence we cannot expect the US to see and look to the future and say, well, oh, it's going to be true. Yes, we would take this um, treaty. Secondly, we say that the reason during that time uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this moment, the US believes that it was incredibly unfair for them because China and India, Brazil, South Africa, um, Israel, South Korea, who are all quite floppy states already, did not have to do anything. And they believe it was fundamentally unfair. And they believe it is justified for them because, well, Israel could do a bit more. So we say that was already another fact supporting that they had the right. And moreover, we want to say that this idea about without Kyoto, we could have not moved forward. This is also wrong. We say that the U.S. also knew that since they did not, if they did not ratify the treaty, that does not mean that they could have not done anything. Yeah. And we proved to you the evidence that from cities, mayors try to do, uh, try to make a difference, and the U.S. has shared uh, uh, all sorts of technology. Now, moving on to my second construction point, where we have the idea of where we would harm the interests. What we want to put through here is what we want to say is the U.S. economy is a bit different from other world economies. And we say that since the U.S. is a very unique, uh, unique country in the world, and Shabelle also put this idea forward in Soviet Logan, we have this idea of European countries who are very cute, who have this very high-tech technology, uh, or at least high-tech industry. We say, well, they can, of course, manage with this sort of uh, environmental changes, while the U.S., which is a bit more uh, concentrated on, on fuels, energy, industries, etc., etc., it is going to hurt their economic interests much, much more, and hence we have to see that the U.S. has to protect uh, its interests. And also, um, uh, speaking about the environment, how will the U.S. citizens should also care about the environment? Since we see that if the U.S. had acted, and if China and India had not, it still would have not made a very big difference, ladies and gentlemen, because China and India are very big polluters. Now, coming to my last point about the consequences, we firstly want to say that this should have been a good analysis. It's not very sophisticated, and we cannot say that, well, the world would have been so fluffy because, well, the U.S. didn't do anything. So we firstly said, no, that's not very cute from the negative side of the business. We secondly said that Kyoto actually was very ineffective when we speak of the European trade system, etc., etc. And last but not least, we want to say that this new treaty and this grassroots level has come from the fact that the U.S. rejected the Kyoto pre Treaty. Because firstly, we have forced the scientists to actually come up with a reasonable evidence. Secondly, we have given people an opportunity to come up with their own environmental incentives. And last but not least, it has given countries the push they need. So, well, good luck, Obama. Let's just say the U.S. was right to reject the Kyoto Protocol. At least George Bush was marching some things. Yay. <laughs> Um, costly ways to deal with an existing problem. So after five repetitive speeches, I believe that this 